Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and and being a steward of the land. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Tim, we got a special guest again with the DNR. Uh, Tyler Harms is going to be with us today. Uh, but before we get to that, let's talk about, you know, we always start off our shows with uh, what we what we did in the last week, week and a half, two weeks. Yeah, it's really been a busy week, Joel. And uh, um, so first off, um, my farm this year is in corn. And uh, the last two years, we've really had some droughts. And our corn's looking great. I mean, it's like 11 foot tall. I mean, most of the, most of the stocks have two two uh, cobs on it so I'm really excited about that and that's what my food plot's in this year so um, also we put up a new tree stand on a on an area to where it's I think it's going to be a nice little pinch point it's off of a new pond that my wife's named Red Dog Pond Uh, we have vishlas as you know and uh, then we mowed trails so that that pretty much took up most of my week and and uh I'm excited. I'm starting to get excited. I also, oh, I also finished putting up uh, the rest of my cameras, and I, I had already had uh, three cameras up and took off some preliminary uh, pictures. So I'm seeing a couple of things, but uh, nothing that I don't see any booners per se. But it's enough to get the blood starting to flow for sure. Yeah, I mean, at the time of this recording, we're roughly six weeks away from opening bow season. So. Yep. Uh, you know, it's right around the corner. It's coming fast. It always comes fast, faster than no matter how much you can plan for. It right? sure does. So, how about yourself? Yeah, I mean, uh, the one the one big objective I had uh, in the last week was getting food plot fall food plots in. So these beans that I've been talking about on previous podcasts, I've been controlling the weeds on. Well, I got the weeds controlled, and then I just dissed half of them under. Right. So, uh, <clears throat> but for a good cause, I, I planted uh, about two to three acres of uh, kitchen sink and we'll talk in a future episode what kitchen sink is but a brassica a brassica mix of 10 different brassicas Um, so i'm excited to have those in the ground a lot of work getting them in there and now i'm just praying for some rain which uh you know it's it's been two weeks now with no rain and the the next 10 days looks dry so i'm I'm hoping uh, i'm hoping to get some timely rain and uh, see that stuff start start growing and, and uh, producing. Excellent. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, and Tyler, I'll toss you in the mix here, sure. but um, I don't know if you're bird watchers or not, but uh, hummingbirds in your guys' location, for whatever reason around my uh, place, have just been going crazy. Yeah, we've been seeing a lot of hummingbirds? Yeah, we just started seeing them. Uh, my wife's got some uh, hostas that are up, and uh, they've really been keen on those hostas for whatever reason. Yeah, so we it's just been kind of interesting sitting out at night in the cool weather, which is yeah. nice at night, and then uh, seeing the hummingbirds buzz around. Funny story is my I have a vishla also, blue. But my wife's a uh, hunt, raises honey, beekeeper, Mm -hmm. and Blue's had his shares of stings over the last uh, year specifically. So he's a little gun shy with anything buzzing. So anytime these hummingbirds come anywhere close to him, I mean, they sound like a (laughs) supersonic bee, right? Right. And he's just, he looks around and heads to the front door and he's gone. So (laughs) we got to get him past that. But. You know, all fun and games, good stories, a lot of good work. We got a lot of work to do between now and hunting season, but we'll get there, right? 
But with that, um, you know, let me introduce Tyler Harms. Tyler's with the Iowa DNR. Tyler, why don't you uh, kind of give us a little intro, and then I'm sure you've been pretty busy the last week. Love to hear what you're doing. Yeah, I have been. Thanks, Joel and Tim, for having me uh, on this podcast. Really excited to be here. Uh, as you said, my name's Tyler Harms. I'm the uh, Wildlife Biometrician and Deer Program Leader for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. It's been a pretty fun week for me uh, in the last week here. Um, I know we're going to talk a lot about deer today, but my last week has actually uh, not really been related to deer. We, uh, we have a project uh, here with the DNR right now uh, looking at monitoring trumpeter swans. And so my last week's been chasing trumpeter swans around uh, northern Iowa, and it's, it's been, a, been a lot of fun. That's one of the joys of, of my job as the biometrician as I get to, get to uh, embark on lots of fun projects on lots of different critters. So. That's amazing. How, how big is, a, you know, kind of your average swan? About, an adult's probably about 20 pounds. Big, uh, on average, big birds, right? yeah. I mean, these are one of the bigger, bigger birds out there, right? Biggest waterfowl species in North America. Yeah, so they're really? they're a real big bird. So when you say you're chasing them around, I mean, what's that mean? I mean, are you literally chasing them around, or we are? Yeah. So the goal is to to capture one of the adults, which right now uh, the the swan adults are molting, and they undergo what's called a simultaneous molt. So they molt all their flight feathers at one time. So they're actually flightless for a certain period of time. And uh, that's when we capture them because they're easy, easy to capture when they can't, or relatively easy to capture, I'll say, when they can't fly away from us. Uh, and so, so yeah, the, the, the way we do it is we, um, we put a boat in the water and, and uh, we, we go after them and scoop them up in a net, essentially. Um, and uh, what we're doing is putting GPS collars on them so we can track the adult movements. And then we're also capturing the cygnets or the young birds with the adults. And we're marking them with uh, just alphanumeric collars that you may have seen before on swans sure. or geese. Uh, and we're going to use that information to try to estimate that first year survival. Um, kind of information that we're hoping to, to get to, to inform a management plan for trumpeter swans that we're currently developing. So I digress here. So yeah. Yeah. hey, we got we got time. So we got, it's just SD card space. Tim. On on these uh, on these collars. So when you're trying to track mortality, how do you know if when they're dead? Good question. So um, the for the cygnets, what we're going to do is they'll so they'll stay with mom and dad all through the winter, basically until next spring when mom and dad go to nest again. That's when they kind of kick them out of the house. Uh, not too different from deer, really. You know, the, the young will stick with mom for the first winter, and then mom will kick them out when, when she's starting to, or at least in the fall, when she's starting to think about breeding. And so we're going to use the GPS collars on the swans to know where the cygnets are. And so then that, because we're assuming that they're going to be with mom and dad, we'll be able to see the, the young birds with mom and dad. And basically, if, you, if we don't see them with mom and dad, we assume that they're dead unless mm -hmm. we see them at a subsequent time interesting yeah okay My, then they might is there a migratory are these a migratory birds they they are not nearly to the extent that that we see other waterfowl species migrate in iowa um, things like mallards and canada geese for example um, they they do migrate but because they're such a big hardy bird they can withstand our cold iowa winters uh, quite well and and many of the birds that that we see nest in, in Iowa will stick around um, Iowa. Essentially, anywhere there's open water, you can probably find swans in Iowa in the wintertime. How cool. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're a neat bird. Super interesting. Before, I know we're, and you're going to be moderating today, JJ, but uh, um, where are we at, Tyler? Tell us where we're at, what we've got here on our table. and. Yeah, you bet. So, so we're at the Boone Wildlife Research Station in Boone, Iowa. Uh, it's one of three wildlife research stations that we, we have in the state. Uh, the other two, one up in Clear Lake in northern Iowa, and then uh, one in Sheraton uh, down in southern Iowa. So uh, so welcome welcome to central Iowa to both of you. Got a couple of prairie chickens, greater prairie chickens here on the table in front of us that, uh, that have been uh, collected over the years as part of our uh, greater prairie chicken efforts uh, that, um, that are ongoing down in southern Iowa to try to restore this uh, species to the state. So pretty... Uh, Pretty amazing species. I know we were commenting on them before we got started this morning, just about how how cool they look and and uh, how much I think we all wish we would have the chance to harvest one of these cool birds. Yeah, I was just sitting here thinking it's probably the closest I'm ever going to get to one, even though it's stopped, <laughs> That's right? The truth. So, uh, That's the truth. but they are unique and beautiful. 
Beautiful birds. Well, with that, let me build on that uh, question, Tyler. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what your job is, where you grew up, and you know, past education, and then we'll get into your job functions. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a I'm an Iowa boy, uh, born and raised. I grew up in uh, North Central Iowa near a small town uh, called Titonka, uh, kind of in the heart of the what we call the Prairie Pothole region of Iowa. So up in the flat country where there's lots of grass and and lots of wetlands, and um, Lived up there for most of my life until I just embarked on a college career down here at Iowa State University. I got a bachelor's degree in uh, what's called animal ecology from Iowa State. Uh, shortly after that, continued on to get a master's degree in wildlife ecology from Iowa State. Um, and left uh, after I finished that, I, I went into the workforce for uh, a few years. Um, Stayed at Iowa State University. I'm a Cyclone fan, if you can't tell. Um, worked for Iowa State in a, a really unique position. It was actually a partner position between Iowa State and the Iowa DNR um, as a research and monitoring biologist for two years. Um, stayed at Iowa State, transitioned into a different position for three years, and then started with the Iowa DNR here just uh, three years ago as the, as the biometrician and, and uh, deer biologist. So Awesome. That's really awesome. So... That's a lot of a lot going on there with that job title, right? So yeah. You, can you uh, boil that down for us uh, in the audience? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, biometrician that it's always a head scratcher for most fo- folks, and uh, the way I explain it is, I'm I'm a wildlife math guy. So so as a biometrician, I uh, provide technical guidance on uh, statistics, uh, population modeling. Uh, research and survey design to the entire Wildlife Bureau for the DNR. Uh, and then I'm also the deer, deer program leader. So uh, everything that comes with that position, which uh, for me primarily includes uh, population management of white-tailed deer in the state and, and other associated roles, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit, you know, maintaining and implementing our chronic wasting disease response plan, which is a, a, a big topic, a big issue that's facing a lot of Midwest states um, right now. And, and other things associated with, with deer. So, Now, when I called you and asked for the interview, I did warn you that we're two dumbasses here. So if we're going to talk math, you got to keep it, you know, fingers and toes kind of math for us, okay? You, we'll do. We'll okay. do. It's do simple. The, you got to dumb it down for us. I can do that. I can, I can, well, I can try. We'll, we'll do our best. Awesome. Awesome. So let's, let's take the first, um, you know, the, the first objective of your job or function of your job um, I mean would you say the largest piece of this is the antlerless deer or the deer counts yeah yeah so so the a big part of my job is that population management component for for white tailed deer and and um, the way that that we do that in Iowa is uh, primarily through through harvest right and actually a lot of states <clears throat> harvest is the primary way that they manage their their deer populations and each state does a little bit differently In Iowa, as you mentioned, Joel, uh, we rely primarily on our county antlerless quotas, our county antlerless licenses, which I'm sure most of your listeners are familiar with. Um, And we have a a pretty sophisticated and and long process that we go through to determine what those quotas should be for any particular county in the state in a given year. Can we, maybe that's the place to start is um, if it is a big process, which it sounds like it is, um, can we kind of chunk it down into a as simple of a process, you know, that we can understand and then our audience could get a grasp on what's that process look like? Yeah, absolutely. So so it, the, the process starts essentially right after the hunting season ends in, in early January. Uh, the first step is to essentially summarize uh, the harvest statistics that we have for the year, uh, for, the, for the previous year. So we're looking at uh, what the statewide harvest was, how it compared to previous years, um, and then we can break that down into smaller spatial units. So looking at either our, our wildlife management units or our county, you know, just looking at those harvest statistics because Harvest is really um, one of the best, uh, what we call, indices to, to what our population is doing. In other words, um, if, if harvest goes down in the, in the effort, meaning the license sale stays the same, then, then we can infer from that that maybe the population is, is on a downward trend, and vice versa. If harvest is going up, we have the same effort, we might be able to infer that the population is going up. And I'm, I'm assuming that the data that you gather on harvesting is from the, the call-in exactly. data? Exactly. Yep, yep. So we have a mandatory reporting system in, uh, in Iowa. So uh, 
we, we encourage, actually require hunters to report their harvest either by calling in, um, you can do it online, and actually uh, I believe this year we're going to, be going to implement a text message reporting as well oh, that'd uh, be nice. which, is a, which is a nice new feature that that we're excited mm-hmm. about so so i you know i always talk about how important it is for hunters to remember to report their harvest because that's some of the best information that we can get on on um, what the deer population is doing in a year. yeah i would i would put a plug in just last year i think um was the first time that i downloaded the dnr app yeah and then you know before i was calling mm-hmm. in and a lot of you know, for Southern Iowa, the, the, the cell service is kind of questionable sometimes, so you'd have to do it two or three times maybe or whatever. Sure. But, man, that app, I would really encourage our audience, that app is, is wor- it's free, yeah. and it makes your harvest reporting so simple. Yeah, if you're in the state of Iowa, that app's great. I mean, I'm sure all the other states have probably a, an app very similar to that, I, I would think. Yeah, it's, it's a nice, slick app works really well yeah okay so you've got your uh, harvest hey, could, could Go I, ask, ahead. I do have one question sure Tyler so you get this data and you you bring it in from uh, from the call-in data so mm-hmm. it's for the state then you get it down by the county how how small of a unit can you track that data down to if you wanted to yeah great question so so county is really the smallest unit that we have and that's basically the unit at which you're you're reporting uh, that that harvest, and so we can we can summarize uh, antler deer harvest, antlerless harvest at the at the county level. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm just sitting here thinking of when I when I fill my tag in, what what did the questions that you ask, right? So yeah. um, yep. okay, so you've got the the data from the harvest, um, and we'll come back and revisit questions on this. But sure. um, you, what's the next step in the process? So, uh, so we have the harvest data, and in, and in Iowa, um, we're, we're somewhat unique in that we have a number of other data sources that we rely on, too, uh, that, that help tell us what the, what's happening with the deer population in any given year. And, and your listeners might be familiar, or at least have heard of, um, of some of these data sources. So the first is uh, what we call our bow hunter observation survey. Uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure you, some of your listeners have even participated in this survey in the past. It's a diary survey that we send out to archery hunters every year. Um, and we ask them to uh, record uh, what they're seeing in the field while they're, while they're spending time in the sand. So number of deer that they see, both antlered and antlerless deer, number of turkeys, and number of lots of other critters that we have on this form. I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about this survey later today, so I won't go into much detail. Uh, but that's one of the, the kind of the independent uh, data sources that we use to help tell help us learn about what's happening with the deer population. Uh, A couple other examples that we have are actually data sources that we get from the Department of Transportation. And those are um, what we call the roadkill data. So uh, for those of you that don't know, the the DOT spends a lot of time along our major roadways in Iowa removing uh, roadkill deer and and other roadkill critters. Uh, And they record those data as they're out and about doing that. And and, um, that's actually one of the longest running I guess besides harvest, uh, one of the longest running data sources that we have that we've used to inform uh, on deer population trends. Interesting. I would not have, that was not uh, in my question bank. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it's really interesting. Is that by county as well? That's by county as well. Yep. And then we use uh, reported crashes as well. So deer vehicle collisions. Wow. Uh, And all of these data sources there's you know there's there's benefits to these data sources the 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 number one benefit is that it's an independent data source right so it allows us to when you when you have lots of data sources that you're using to tell you hopefully the same thing that's beneficial because if they all converge on each other you know you've got a pretty good idea of what's happening right if those if those lines are are far apart then you kind of scratch your head a little bit as to what's really going on but lucky for us a lot of these data sources are pretty close together. When you've got six different data sources telling you the same thing about the deer population, you can feel pretty confident about about what you're, what you're seeing in the data. So that's that's the benefit of, or one of the benefits of those uh, data sources. And the other benefit of it too is that obviously, you know, we manage the deer population for, for the citizens, citizens of Iowa. We want to provide a quality recreational experience for our hunter, hunters, but we also want to try to minimize any potential negative impacts that deer are going to cause in the state and we know that deer certainly can cause some some negative impacts and deer vehicle collisions is one of those and so we monitor those closely as well because we want to try to minimize those as much as possible 
kind of strike the balance between between a you know a healthy population that's going to provide a good quality recreational experience and a in a healthy population that's going to try to minimize those negative impacts. Yeah, that's super interesting. We had we had Kevin Anderson on here from Iowa DNR wildlife biologist. You know, and he we, he was talking about back in the 70s, you know, there really were no whitetail. Mm-hmm. I mean, minimal maybe is a better way of saying it. Yep. And uh, through DNR efforts today, I mean, we we have that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. The, the white-tailed deer has a really interesting history in the state of Iowa. Like you said, they were, you know, extirpated from the state. Very few of them back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Fast forward to the mid, mid-2000s, mid we're seeing record harvest. Uh, you know, some would probably argue there were too many deer in the state at that time. Um, and, you know, now we've... Through, through management, which I'll say again, you know, management happens with hunters. We, we, can't, we can't make this happen without our hunters. They play a critical role. And, and through, that, uh, through that management and, and hunter harvest, we've been able to, to manage the population at, uh, right at our population goal, which is about 100,000 deer harvested each year. Uh, we've been doing that, to kind of maintain that level since 2013, and, and uh, we're, we're holding steady on that. So. And that's across all tags sold, all, all um, that's, muzzle loading, bow, shotgun, so on. Exactly. Yep. That's statewide harvest. I think last year was around 110. Do you remember what last year's was? Yeah. So, tw- well, so last year, 2019, we were um, just shy of 100,000. In fact, we were 99,999 deer harvested in the oh, state of Iowa come last on. year. So, You're Tyler. <laughs> so, I'm going to blame one of you guys for not shooting number 100,000 there. <laughs> In fact, it's probably, I know people think I make that number up when I, when I say that, but that's, that's what the data tell me. You so should I'm just going, change I'm it just to it, make it not. Just tweak it yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I, know, yeah. I know. Data integrity. Uh, yeah. So 2018, uh, the year prior, we were, we were just shy of 110,000, about 108,000. Uh, that was where we were. So we saw about an 8% decrease uh, between 2018 and 2019. And it, the weather, I think... You know, in my personal opinion, the weather during certain seasons, obviously, I think, would you agree shotgun season is where most deer are harvested? Shotgun season is by far where we see the, the highest harvest. Yep, about 50% of our statewide of that 100,000 deer harvest uh, every year comes during those two shotgun so, seasons. So no, nice and December. cool or nice and warm shotgun seasons, probably more deer harvested. And if there's blizzards and snow and maybe not as much so yeah absolutely and it was was it 2018 um or maybe even 2017 where we had just a horrible first shotgun season 2018 you know, 2018, 2018 snow 2018. wet miserable. just miserable uh and we saw a really significant drop in harvest during that first shotgun season actually we saw a, lot, a number of hunters uh called in and opted to switch their first season license to the second second season that year because wow. it was just a miserable weather year so you're right joel yeah weather weather plays a big role in what we see in harvest uh, not only from from a hunter behavior standpoint but also from a deer behavior I, standpoint i, I didn't even well. know you could do that yeah is that an option or was that just an option that year you, of- no that's an option every year there is a small fee i, I believe to switch it maybe three four or five bucks but yeah but you can you can switch that's it. worth it so yeah, I did not know that. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, we are we are two dumbasses. So <laughs> take into consideration. All right, so you've got your data. A lot of a lot, honestly, a lot more sources of data than I I knew about. Yeah. Um, what do you do with it next? Great question. So so we summarize it. We plug it into to a uh, what we call an accounting population model, which is a pretty um, uh, a pretty typical model that most states use. But essentially, what it does is it takes takes uh, those data sources, takes what we know about uh, deer in the state in terms of survival and, and uh, mortality rates, harvest rates, things like that. And it kind of all boils it down into one big big line that we track through time, and it's a trend line. So the, you know, the question I often get from folks is, well, how many, how many white-tailed deer do we have in the state of Iowa? And, and that's, a, that's a challenging question because we know we can't count every single deer in the state, right? And, and, and we don't really try, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, we count deer, but we, we consider those a survey that are going to, that provide an index to, to what the population is doing. And so what that trend line tells us, and that's really what we're interested in is, is that trend line stable? Is it going up? Is it going down? And where is it relative to our population goal? Sure. Uh, and so we look at that trend line at the statewide scale, 
Uh, we look at that trend line at the, the management unit scale and then even at the county scale um, to see, see where that line is relative to what our population goal is for, for any given spatial unit. And so all of those data sources help inform that line. Uh, once we get that line, um, we send it out to all of our field staff. So folks like Kevin Anderson that you talked about, private lands biologists, we have uh, wildlife management biologists all over the state. Um, they, they provide input on, on um, what that model is showing. So, so we all know, you know, it's a model. Models are useful, but not always right. And so we rely really heavily on input from our field staff to verify what, what the, the data are showing us. And, and most of the time, uh, they're confirming what the data are showing us. They're, you know, if the trend line's going down, they'll say, yep, it just doesn't seem like there's as many deer out there in my county or in my area as, as what there has been in past years. And we combine that information with the data and we use that to, to inform what the county antlerless quotas are gonna be. So, so we, we kind of have the, the data-driven process, which is a really key component. And as a wildlife, as wildlife biologists, that's what we strive for is to try to try to make the process as objective as possible and the data help us do that. But we do really rely on that critical input from our field staff and from, from the public as well on, on what they're seeing out there because that helps confirm what the, or deny for that matter, what the data are showing. So let me make sure I understood what, what you said is um, what I, you're really using the harvest uh, trend of the line by year. Yep. Um, is it going up or down to, and that's really what you're, Ideally, you'd want that to be flat at $100,000 or $100,000. 100,000 deer per year um, is what you're targeting statewide. Exactly. And I'm assuming you break that down by county too and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, as you can imagine, some, some counties, we have some counties that are slightly above population goal, some counties that are slightly below population goal, and we kind of work in those counties with the county antlerless quotas to try to get them up or down depending on where they where they're at. But I thought I also heard is is that we really don't we don't have a true understanding of what the total population is within Iowa. Yeah, I mean, in most mostly because we don't you know we we don't have a good way of counting all yeah. the deer yeah. in the state. Yeah. Um, you know, we can develop models to try to estimate that uh, with a with a certain level of precision, meaning there's going to be a plus or minus fifty thousand or something something like that, but. But at the end of the day, that's that's really not not the we're not managing for a number, right? We're managing for well, I shouldn't say that. We're managing for a harvest number, not necessarily a population number, and we're managing for that trend line, which, like you said, Joel, ideally, if we're at one hundred thousand harvested every year, we want that trend line to be flat because we just want to maintain that. Yep. And for most populations, I mean, the, the trend lines get a bounce. You know, it's it we expect it to kind of bounce back and forth. Sure around that. It's not going to be perfectly flat every year, and, and that's expected in any population. Um, and so we just kind of manage that manage that's that I, level. That's what I tell my family all the time, you know, you, you can't measure a trend with one dot. I think <laughs> two, ten, two, two dots make a trend line, yeah. right? Yeah, that's so, exactly mm -hmm. right. Yep. So going back to that, uh, so I think, I mean, from what you said, it makes total sense to me, right? I mean, from a harvest perspective, but putting you on the spot, how many deer do we have? Roughly. How many deer that do we have yeah. in the state of Iowa? Roughly, roughly. I won't hold you to it. Plus or minus fifty. Oh, plus or minus fifty thousand. I w I would say, we'll say four hundred fifty thousand deer in the state of Iowa. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah. Plus or, plus or minus fifty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Half a million. So a twenty percent harvest is. Yep, and that's that's a pretty typical in in most states. Um, you know, you you see about twenty percent harvest per year. And and what we what we generally say, um, although we've never we've never tested this, and I don't think we would ever want to test this, but with without harvest, the deer population in Iowa could grow about twenty percent per year. Wow, up so, to a point. I'm assuming then bad things happen. Then nature's gonna yeah. nature's gonna help us out with that. Why? Which in is again way. why yeah why hunting you know is is such an important part of that management process. That's ninety thousand deer, deer, roughly ninety to hundred thousand dollar a year extra deer a year i think and that's, that's a ton. <clears throat> that's a key point there right i mean because there's a lot of people out there that think it's like hey you shouldn't be hunting deer I mean, you shouldn't be hunting period there's a lot of people that are anti hunters not just white tail it could be anything mm -hmm. right and what i don't think they really understand is the important role 
that hunters have in being a partner with the Department of Natural Resources to manage those populations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a lot of demonstrated um, history and science that shows that that an unmanaged population is going to cause some problems, not only ecologically but but socially as well. And and um, you know, we we want to try to maintain a, a, a balanced population that that is cons- consistent with our with the needs of our constituents, but also uh, consistent with with what nature can provide for us as well. And then that, that just leads to a, a, a quality population, a healthy population, which we have in Iowa, and that's, that's really important. Yeah, we don't, want, we don't want any deer pandemics, right? Instead of COVID, it'd be a cervid pandemic. We don't want that. No. <laughs> I vote if I just keep moving this forward. Here, uh, so you, you get feedback from the field staff. Hey, directionally, does this, these numbers look good? You see anything, you know, otherwise? And then the, the next step of the process? Yeah. So then the next step is is um, looking at each county individually and what what those quotas are. And and if you know if the if the trend line is showing us that that county is is staying stable, our field staff are confirming that trend line. Chances are the the county antlerless quota in that county is gonna is gonna stay right right where it's at. Um, you know, if we have a trend line that's going up or going down or is a little above or below that population goal, then we're gonna we're gonna adjust that that county antlerless quota up or down depending on where we're at. So if we want um, if we if we want a population to go down, we'll up that quota a little bit. If we want a population to go up, we'll lower the quota a little bit. Um, you know, managing for a, a big game species, large mammal species like white-tailed deer, uh, the population growth is driven primarily by that adult female survival. They're 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 the the reprodu- you know reproductive um, sex, and so so the that the survival of those individuals is really what's going to drive a population up or down, which is why we use that antlerless harvest to to help maintain that that population. So, t- and manage so- it. So Tyler, is there a place um, a hunter could go to find out what the, I guess I don't even know, to be honest with you, I guess that doesn't say much, but where you could find out where the doe quotas are by county? Yeah, so our on our uh, website, we have uh, the, the map of the county antlerless quotas uh, published on the website. Also printed in the hunter regulations uh, booklet as well, or hunting regs booklet. Yeah, I brought the, the I just got it. Yesterday, my wife picked it up. 2021 regs, and uh, there's it's got a map with the quotas on it, but it's also on the website. It is. Yeah, and, and those quotas. Um, so after we determine what those quotas are, uh, they are uh, set by changing our administrative rules, which are essentially the rules that govern. Um, deer hunting in the state, and so, uh, so after we have the numbers picked, then there, then that starts a, a fairly um, uh, sophisticated or, or lengthy process of of getting those numbers approved. Um, any any time we want to change administrative rule, uh, it has to be approved by our Natural Resources Commission, which is a commission of citizens that have been appointed by the governor's office to to um, oversee what we're what we're doing as an agency. And it also, they also have to be reviewed by what's called the Administrative Rules and Review Committee, which is a committee of legislators that essentially make sure that, that we're operating within our, uh, within, our, within our power, that we're not changing things that, that we as a, as a commissioner, as an agency, don't have sure. power to change. Um, and so, and so that's, that's essentially how those are, are set every year. How would, how would um, and I'll just pick a, a county here randomly, let, let's say Butler County, you know, there's counties here that have zero, and I think the range here is from zero to, I see a 4,000 on there, yeah. right? So big range by county. Um, how would, is there an option for counties to change that quota number or put in a request to change that quota number, either up or down for various reasons? Like individual individuals within a county? Um, or, a, or as a county, right? As a county. So if I'm sitting in Butler County right now and I'm saying, geez, I'm seeing, I'm a farmer, I own some land here, I'm seeing deer everywhere, I'd really like to get more antlerless tags, but these 150 tags are always bought out before I, you know, get to the store and buy them. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't understand why, you know, why I can't, 
why why can't my quota be a thousand and and uh, you know Alamakee County gets lowered by a thousand to balance everything out? Sure, good question. So um, the best process for that because these are um, changes to administrative rule. They do go through an open public comment period every year, and that that period's usually from um, late February through um, through March. Uh, this year it was a, a little bit delayed because of obviously the pandemic and COVID nineteen. Things got delayed this year, but but that would be the best. That's the best venue or opportunity for individuals within a county to say, hey, look, you know, I I just really don't agree with this this number. You know, I think I have. I have more deer um, in my area. I think the county quota um, should be should be a little bit higher, and they they can provide that that comment um, as part of the process, that public feedback. Um, you know, oftentimes I'll have folks contact me directly and say, you know, how does this work? I I really I really feel like there are too many deer in my area. What <laughs> what gives? You know, how come how come I can't get more licenses? And and you know I appreciate those contacts because, like you said, it's part of the verification process. You know, I can un- start to understand. You know, I'm I'm one person based in Central Iowa. I might not have a finger on the pulse of the deer population in Butler County, right? So getting that feedback from the public is important. And oftentimes I'll take advantage of the opportunity at that point to. To, to help uh, individuals be aware of other other opportunities that might be available. So in Butler County, for example, maybe this um, this landowner has uh, having some crop damage issues that oftentimes are very localized to a specific area. Um, so the answer to that situation might not necessarily be let's make more tags available in the entire county uh, because it's such a localized issue. I can refer them to one of our depredation biologists that can meet with that individual one-on-one and issue depredation tags to that individual, which are specific to their farm where they're having the greatest issue with deer. And then they have the opportunity for additional tags that they can use to try to minimize damage to their crops. That makes perfect sense. Good, good solution, right? Good solution and it solves the problem and it's the simplest solution. Yeah. And o- Occam's razor. That's right. And, right. and yeah. I'll tell you, every time I've called you, you've been very responsive when I've told you we needed more tags. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So let's, let's circle back. Let's, sure. let's talk about data here, the data from the harvest tags. First of all, just roughly, do you, how many tags are sold? Um, yeah, so we sell about 330,000 tags a year across all of the license types, which we have several license types in our database. That results in about 160,000 individual deer hunters in the state of Iowa. Okay, every and year. then the harvest rate on that, if I'm doing my two dumbass math here, is around 30%, 30 to 35%. Yeah, success rate's about 30% on average, exactly. Yep. Interesting. So I know, I know it's mandatory, to report your harvest, but um, I think we would, I think we'd all agree that even though it's mandatory, there's not everybody reports, right? Right. Is there is there a uh, function within this model of this process to accommodate um, you know the accuracy of the harvest information coming in? See, you guys are two dumbasses. You guys are asking <laughs> great questions here. That's a great question, Joel. And we and we do, yeah, we do account for. Um, like you said, we're, we're not perfect, right? And, and we know that, that it's not 100% reporting rate. We assume in the model that's about 80% uh, reporting rate. And, and we use that to adjust, uh, adjust that, that harvest. Um, we do uh, have ways in which we can, we can confirm that 80%. And in fact, we're, we're embarking on um, or starting to think about some research efforts that would help us kind of estimate that reporting rate, um, both statewide, but also in different regions as, as well. To, to We wanna to try to get the, the best estimate of harvest as we can. And so every every few years we, we embark on an effort to try to estimate that, to just make sure that our assumption in the model is, is valid. Makes sense, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that seems to be a pretty big, um, you know, the assumption, like you said, it's, it's one of the big assumptions that the whole model's built upon. Yeah, absolutely. So, cool, cool. Um, Tim, any, any questions? Or no, I was just going to, I mean, so if it makes sense to him, it, it makes <laughs> sense to me. So I don't know what you know, Joel is a Lean Sigma Master Black Belt, if you know what that is. 
you know what that is? I think I know what that is. It means I don't want to pick a fight with you is what that uh, means. No, he's a numbers right? guy. Oh, he's a numbers he's guy. A numbers okay. guy. I, I play under the radar. <laughs> all right, all right. Here, Tyler, so um, that, that was my question. Now, look, we need to do a gauge R&R on that harvest study is what sure. I'm trying to say. Sure, right? yeah. So, um, any, any trends? What, what are the trends that you're seeing in county-to-county uh, -county quotas, changes, and things like that over you know the last two or three years? What, what are you seeing as trends? Yeah, so, so statewide, like I said, we've been pretty stable from a, from a harvest standpoint. You know, in, in um, 2017, we were 105,000. 2018, we bumped up to about 107,000. Last year, we dropped down to just shy of 100,000. Um, you know, could be weather. If you both remember, I'm sure uh, many of the listeners remember, we had a pretty significant outbreak of epizootic hemorrhagic disease last summer, yeah. uh, which is going to, uh, you know, knock the population pretty hard. Not surprising that we see a, a drop in harvest after an event like that. What What, what is that? Epi what's that? Epizootic hemorrhagic disease. That, what's Hemor that? You can just call it hemorrhagic disease for short. Yeah. So it's a it's a um, a virus that that affects deer. It's a, what's called an, an arbovirus. So it's, it's transmitted from deer to deer by a biting insect, in this case, a, a culicoides midge. Um, and it's, uh, it essentially just call, it causes uh, internal hemorrhaging and, and fever. So it's CWD. Um, it's not CWD. Very different. Yeah, so chronic wasting disease, or CWD, is actually, although the acronyms sound pretty similar, right? They both end with D. Um, chronic wasting disease is a very different huh. disease that's affecting deer. Uh, in Iowa than, than EHD. So main differences, EHD is um, a virus caused by a biting midge. Chronic wasting disease is actually caused by what we call a prion, which is a misshapen protein that occurs, or that, that we, um, I say we, the deer have in their system. Um, it, the, the, the main difference, I guess I can say, between EHD and CWD is that CWD is always fatal. Once a deer becomes infected, 100% that deer is going to die at some point, whether it dies from symptoms related to CWD or whether it dies uh, being infected from CWD, but, but CWD is not necessarily the ultimate cause. So it, it's, you know, it's, it gets hit by a car, it gets taken by a predator or something like that because it's sick. <clears throat> Hemorrhagic disease, on the other hand, is not 100% uh, fatal in white-tailed deer. Uh, we, deer can survive the disease. Um, and they, they can recover from it. Uh, in Iowa, because we've seen EHD come into the state here fairly recently, we had our first big outbreak in 2012. I don't know if you guys remember that outbreak or not. Um, we have a, our, our population is fairly naive to the disease, meaning it's, it hasn't been exposed for very long to the disease. And so it can have some pretty dramatic population impacts in any, in any given year, depending on the, the degree of of uh, the outbreak in s states in the south where they've had EHD for 30 plus years tends not to be quite as much of an issue because their population has been exposed to that disease for longer um, and so yeah so just the, the main thing I think what you were trying to get at Tim is that yeah EHD and CWD are, are very different diseases um, we we treat them and manage them very differently in terms of a, a population management scenario a chronic wasting disease, CWD, is the one that we're, we're, not that we're not concerned with EHD, but chronic wasting disease is the one that we're very concerned with because it's spread via um, direct contact, animal to animal, 100% fatal. And right now, there's, there's really no sign that it's going to be going away anytime soon. And so we're actively working to try to, try to manage a population. To Sounds like a good uh, topic for a future podcast. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, staying on the topic here of the, the county quota for analysts, which really boils down to harvest this process that you walked us through. Um, I know at the state level, pretty stable. Are you seeing any trends in some of the subcategories, either parts of the state or county by county, that kind of thing? Sure. Yeah. So, so, uh, the first one I'll, I'll mention is Northwest Iowa. Uh, so any of your listeners in Northwest Iowa, I'm sure are very familiar that we've had, um, you know, 27 counties or so in the northwest corner of the state that haven't had any county antlerless licenses available for the last several years, since 2013 or 2014, I want to say. In addition to that, 
uh, we've had a restriction in, in those counties that um, required hunters to harvest um, antler deer only during the first shotgun and early muzzleloader seasons. Essentially trying to allow that antlerless population, that reproductive component of the population to recover so that we can allow the population as a whole to recover in that part of the state. And I mean, so that, that's kind of very much old school. We started off the conversation 50s, 60s, 70s. I mean, that's the way it was, right? Um, um, to, to get the population back up. Yeah, uh, up. yeah. So we've been, we've been watching the population really closely in, in, in those counties and units up in that part of the state because it has been below population goal for, for quite, uh, quite some time. Uh, we're really encouraged by what we're seeing, and in fact, for the for the upcoming deer season, uh, we did take uh, seven of those 27 counties off the list for uh, that buck-only restriction during the first shotgun and early muzzleloader season. So we're starting to see the population recover up there based on our management, which is an encouraging sign. You know, it's um, the, I've always heard the the phrase, uh, you know, managing a population is like steering a battleship, right? You just make these these small incremental changes, and it unfortunately takes a lot of time for a population to recover, but eventually if, if, the, if you make the right decisions, it's gonna get there. And, and what we're seeing in, in uh, Northwest Iowa, and I'm not, certainly don't claim to be the one making the right decisions, but we're, we're definitely seeing a population recovery up there, which is, which is good. Excellent, okay. So. Any other trends, areas? Yeah, so you know we've got um, uh, areas in some parts of Northeast Iowa and South Central Iowa where uh, populations are a little bit above goal, and so we're, you know, we're working in those counties to, to try to, to increase quotas to, to get that population back down to goal levels. Um, you know, that chronic wasting disease is also influencing that, that decision process and conversation as well. You know, we know that, that um, one of the, the best tools that we have right now to try to mitigate the spread of that disease is to try to keep um, population densities at the lower end of a population goal. And so, um, you know, think about areas like South Central Iowa, Wayne County, Northeast Iowa by Alamakee and Clayton County, where we where we have that disease, we're going to try to manage that population down to the lower end of our goal. You know, now I think most folks will often think, okay, they hear chronic wasting disease, they hear increased harvest, and they think we're trying to come in and we're going to just knock out all the all the deer and, and start over. And that's certainly not what we're trying or planning to do in those areas. Uh, but we do know that 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 lower densities, lower you know, at the low end of that goal, what's what's uh, tolerable by by our hunters is is important to try to slow the spread of that. Sure. Disease. You know, hey, can I digress again? I, I am the master digressor. Uh, <laughs> so you know, you talk about steering a battleship. My family always tells me I know a little bit about a lot of things, which is usually amounts to worthless information. <laughs> you guys ever heard of the Trim Tab Society? Trim. Trim Tab Society. Trim Tab Society. I yeah. So look it up, Google. Google. So it, it reminded me when you're talking about how do you steer a battleship. Well, you you don't steer a battleship with the full rudder. I don't know if you guys know this. And if you look at the rudder, there's these little things. It's called a trim tab. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's about 20% of the overall rudder. So whenever they want to steer the ship, they aren't turning the overall. They're turning the, the tabs. tabs. The tabs. Yeah. So it's trim tab society. So the the belief is, and the trim tab society is, is hey. You can get that 20% of the, or smaller of that population. If you can start to steer that, you can change the direction. Yeah. Huh. Sounds like a future book title, buddy. Huh. Yeah. Trim. It, there is a book. Oh, <laughs> damn it. There's always a book. <laughs> always All right. A book. Sorry for that digression. Right. That's great. That was a good digression. <laughs> it was. <laughs> All right. We got Occam Razor and the Trim Tab site oh, in the same God. episode here. So we're, we're good. This we're is good. fantastic. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.